20 years has seen us through a multitude of economic downturns um, and uh, crises, some so tough we've fallen to our knees. Um, and it almost killed us, but it didn't. <laughs> but it didn't, you know. And, and it, 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 crisis doesn't change people, it reveals them. We used to work 80, 90, 100 hour weeks, you see. Um, we, we, we all knew how to work hard. We didn't know how to work hard and work smart. I caught myself saying to my kids, if only you knew how hard it was for me. You know, we always say, you have no idea how. I said, whoa, wait a minute, Polly. You are raising your children so that they don't have the same experiences as you did. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Make It Happen Show. I'm Tim Morris from The Entourage. And this was an amazing conversation with Pauline Nguyen. She's the co-founder of Red Lantern, but also an author and just an incredibly deep thinker about what it takes to turn a life of adversity. And Pauline certainly has had a life of adversity coming here to Australia as a refugee and then working as, as a child in her abusive father's restaurant, other businesses. And she's managed to turn that into an incredibly successful business career, but also into this philosophy on how to approach life that is just really impressive. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. We, we went pretty deep. We explored a whole range of topics uh, brought it back to business, brought it back to the advice that she'd give to her children as they move into business. And there are some brilliant lessons for all of us in this episode. I hope you enjoy. Today, I'm joined by Pauline Nguyen. Pauline, how are you? Welcome on the show. I am so excellent. It is my joy to be here. Thank you for having me, Tim. Great, fantastic. Yeah, very excited to have you on here. Um, I, I know your, your famous restaurant, Red Lantern. In fact, I'd, I'd love to start there. Through a, a very you know long and arduous journey, you actually managed to get Red Lantern into uh, being the most awarded Vietnamese restaurant in the world. How did you make that happen? Oh, it's twenty years now. Twenty years we've been around in a very tough, fickle, and tumultuous industry. Um, I think um, a business that lasts fifteen years places us in the top three percent of businesses in the world that have lasted fifteen years. Right? Uh, what is what is the secret to our success? I I I. I think two things. Uh, the first is that we've always, uh, really always, um, not only business life, but personal life is based on our two greatest values, which are growth and gratitude. And it's it's at the intersection of growth and gratitude, which is where we thrive. Um, you know, uh, gratitude without growth means there can be no progress. And then growth without gratitude is like a cancer. And growth for us has never meant how many more restaurants do we have. Growth for us has always meant how do we grow internally, our personal growth, our relationship growth, um, the, the growth in relationship with our suppliers, with our team members. We're also very big on remaining interesting. And this was one of the things that we vowed to one another in the early years. We used to work 80, 90, 100 hour weeks, you see. Um, we 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 all knew how to work hard. We didn't know how to work hard and work smart. And these days, things are very different. Um, and understanding that, okay, so we need to remain interesting so that the media, the public, our customers always have something to um, look forward to and pay attention to. And so we've had a lot of free media coverage. <laughs> you can't be an interesting person with interesting stories to tell unless you do interesting things, right? And, and life becomes much more juicy. Um, and, you know, 20 years has seen us through a multitude of economic downturns um, and uh, crises, some so tough we've fallen to our knees. Um, and it almost killed us, but it didn't. <laughs> but it didn't, you know, and and it's it, crisis doesn't change people; it reveals them. Yeah. So I think so. First, actually, thing I want to dig into there is um, twenty years in the hospitality game is is an, a lifetime, right? Like so few. We've seen people... so many come and go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would have. I mean, I I had a big background in hospitality, and yeah, to, to see you know a, a restaurant and the people behind it thrive over that period is just is phenomenal. And I think it will, it's one of the first times I've really heard someone talk about really infusing such meaning 
into that space. And so that's the first thing that I really take away from what you've just said there. It's like, yeah, really infusing the meaning. I love be interesting and keep it interesting. I mean, I think that must be one of the ingredients of your success over the time. Uh, then you also mentioned about, you know, being brought down to your knees at times and, you know, just recently, but I'm sure over two decades, it would have had multiple, that happened multiple times. Um, what do you think some of the secrets are for getting back up off your knees? Look, the first question that we always ask is, what has our life already demonstrated? What has our life already demonstrated? Wait a minute, our life has demonstrated time and time again that we get back up and we swing the bat again and we swing the bat again, right? And so um, one of my rules is when I when I speak on, on any platform, I, I only speak from direct experience. What does pivot mean, right? What does it mean to pivot? Pivot simply means a redirection of energy, a redirection of energy. Okay, are we going to waste our energy freaking out, playing victim, complaining, or are we going to transmute this energy now into something um, very, very different? Nothing changes if nothing changes, right? And so uh, when COVID hit, uh, you know, same thing, what has our life already demonstrated? You know, uh, when COVID it's not good news for restaurants, you know, having to close our doors. It's not good news for an international speaker. You ain't going anywhere internationally. <laughs> and and so, okay, where do we redirect our energy here? And um, you know, to what does it mean to to be a spiritual entrepreneur? Is to be in spirit and inspired, and understanding that it's only in that state of constant inspiration that we can come up with new ideas that we can come up with new solutions. And so we become leaders of sanity rather than <laughs> freaking out because our people are always watching us, right? They're always watching us. And uh, this is where um, resilience and, um, and courage and grit come into uh, the picture. And um, those three things together, courage, resilience and grit, calm courage, I should say, calm courage, resilience and grit um, is a lot of the reason why Red Lantern is still in the game, <laughs> and, and what, when, while many are not. So that's, I mean, that is a very inspiring, powerful, and kind of optimistic uh, viewpoint. And so, where where has that come from in you? Like, it's, it seems like it's at the at the core of your being. Like, what has led you to have that viewpoint? Oh, I have a very interesting childhood upbringing. Um, my father was uh, quite a violent man. He suffered terribly from PTSD. Uh, we are refugees. Um, we escaped Vietnam just after the war. So growing up, I started working when I was seven. Um, my brother, Louis, started working when he was six. My brother, Luke, the famous one, started working when he was four. My father was quite the entrepreneur. He had a video library. He had an ice cream parlor. He had a restaurant as well as, um, or he were, you know, we were baristas and um, also had a drive, he had a driving school on the side as well. Us kids provided the child labor. So work ethic was instilled into us, a ferocious work ethic at a very early age. I know what fear smells like. We, we were abused a lot, um, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, uh, growing up. And so I look at that as my training, Tim, to answer your question. We all have a choice. Uh, to to look back and see the things that happened to us and see uh, will I play victim or will I play beneficiary? We all have a choice. And so I choose to see that I was a beneficiary of all that happened to me and for me and through me and from me. And so that, that answers your question, where it came from. Could you remember when you first started um, seeing yourself as the beneficiary of all that? Could, could you, how old were you when you started forming this viewpoint? In my late 20s, late 20s, early, early 30s, because, oh, I took a, a lot of personal disruption in order to have a new viewpoint. When you get so sick and tired of having the same viewpoint, it's time for evolution. And I knew that I had to become a very different person if I was to, that's when I wanted to, I started thinking about having children, you see, and I needed to become a very different person if I were to um, raise children of my own. Yeah, and, and not have them go along so many of the, of the lows and challenging points that you had. 
Um, although interestingly, how do you then how do you then instill some of the same great drive and and sort of lessons into your children if, if you're doing it from a more positive place? Actually, I'm very interested in, in your strategies there. Well, in the early years, I caught myself saying to my kids, "If only you knew how hard it was." <laughs> you, know, you know, we always say, "You have no idea how." I said, "Whoa, wait a minute, Pauline." you are raising your children so that they don't have the same experiences as you did. And understanding that trauma gets passed down the generations if it is not healed. And um, my daughter is uh, almost 16. My son is uh, 11. And they're very different personalities. And so how do we instill anything into our children it is by leading by example Uh, and they mirror us they model us and they do so in their own unique way and understanding that every human being goes through particular levels of development and so understanding that our children are at particular stages of development and so as a grown-ass adult if we're looking at them and screaming at them and going, yeah, we might as well talk, be talking to a dog, you know, because they are at that level of development. They cannot see any any farther out. And so we have we hold them with compassion and grace and we hold them in that space. And I can only speak from experience because I was an amateur parent in the early years. <laughs> well, I think we all are. Uh, there is no parent university, right? And so um, understanding, okay, well, this isn't working, is it? This isn't working. And so we uh, adopt new strategies and and new ways that um, uh, exhibit more powerful behaviours for our children. Um, While many allow their um, emotions to fuel their behaviours, when we reach or when we go towards closer towards mastery, we understand then that we um, change our behaviours to fuel our emotions. And so are your children, uh, does your daughter or your son uh, demonstrate entrepreneurial uh, flair? Do you think they'll be following in your footsteps and getting into business? If I were to say either, they they both do, but in a very different way. My daughter is highly, uh, she has physical intelligence. She has social intelligence. Um, She's worked in Red Lantern, uh, uh, you know, getting... um, work experience she absolutely hates it (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but she's very she has the entrepreneurial spirit whereas my son um, is more academic artistic creative um, quite quite studious and he's always looking for ways to create and and make money you know but he's still only 11 and uh, he'll rather you know do no thing (laughs) Good, that's a good little hustle. That's something. <laughs> they, they, oh, yeah, they can both hustle. <laughs> what would be your key bits of advice to them? Uh, I don't know if you've had this conversation with them yet, but if you were to say, hey, these are my key bits of advice as you start along the business journey, what would that be? My son in particular has this great sense of um, wanting to achieve mastery in a lot of the things we do. Um, when I was younger, if there was one thing my parents allowed us to get a taste of, it was mastery. So uh, I know that in this lifetime, in, in our life, to all our souls, our souls are, are wanting us to have a master's degree, not to dabble. Um, and so growing up, for example, um, in the restaurants, when my father made the soups the, or the, the dishes, it constant tweaking. Con- it constant tweaking. If we thought it was perfect, it can always be better. You know, in the when we were making ice cream, it was the most exquisite, delicious, natural fruit ice cream. And so we started picking the fruit. I remember so vividly scraping the passion fruit and um, choosing the ripe bananas. And uh, it just needed to be so integral and uh, proper churning machines and pasteurizing machines, uh, even making the cones, getting the regular cones wasn't good enough. We had to make waffle cones which required you know bending around the molds and um, getting the cappuccino froth just right and so my my son uh, I do a lot of that in in what I in in real life so he these days um, he's obsessed with knitting and (laughs) 
because it requires focus and concentration. And so, you know, he, he finished his mastering something and now he's doing uh, knitting while learning French. <laughs> so he'll be learning French while, while, while he, needs to, he needs to do those things. This Whereas, is sounding a little bit overachieving for me. It's definitely <laughs> mastery in many, many multiple areas at once. Um, it's not, um, I, I love that you talk about mastery. I love that you're instilling it into, into them. And I, I think um, the pursuit of mastery isn't as common as it should be. Like, what, do you think this is, is it on the rise? Is it on the wane? What can we do to inspire more people to pursue mastery in whatever field they're in? You know, I, I don't believe in shoving anything down anyone's throat. But if we're talking about entrepreneurship, if we're talking about business, I think that I strongly believe that the game of business mastery is about the game of mastering influence. And who is the first person we must have influence over for? It's ourselves. We have to have self-mastery first. Uh, we must do the inner work. We have to work really hard to build and fortify the inner internal empire, to fortify the internal core. Because here's the thing. When the ship hits the fan, <laughs> as it often does, not only must the leader, the parent, the partner not only are we responsible we have to be responsible we have to be responsible and so it's the job as the leader and, and we're, we're all leaders here it's our job to remain cool and calm under pressure to not freak out or play victim or complain about the perceived problems and so when the opportunity arises the perceived problem we want to be extracting as much positive value as possible. And from that positive value, we want to make as many empowering meanings from it. So if the challenge comes, what positive value can I extract? And from that, what empowering meaning can I make for my team? And so understanding that it's then our internal ecology that matters most, understanding that we must do the consistent work to keep strong the gatekeepers of our mind. And um, we use the obstacle as the platform to prove to our people why we hold the position that we hold. And so what do leaders do? The leaders go first, right? We have to lead by example. Um, it, it is that um, many leaders don't like to go into the unknown. Um, because they haven't had a much life experience yet. Uh, so we, we, we've got to get experienced. On that, I mean, that is really your, your job as a leader is to go into the unknown, to lead into the unknown. It's almost, um, you know, one of my favourite quotes from Obama is that your job as a leader is to chew up uncertainty and to spit out certainty. So even if you're, you yourself are feeling like you've got no idea what's going on, no idea what the path ahead looks like, you you need to actually turn that into something that you you know your team and your community can can sort of grasp with two hands and, and have confidence following behind. I mean, this last year has certainly um, presented many many challenges for many leaders. Um, what do you think uh, some of the key strategies a leader can sort of rely on to to help you know still themselves, you know, build some certainty out of an uncertain situation and then inspire everyone else along the journey? What do you think they should they should do or say to themselves? First and foremost, calmness of mind is one of the most beautiful jewels of life. Whatever it takes to have calmness of mind, because your people will always follow the most calm, composed and confident leader, right? They're, they're not going to follow the person who freaks out. The calm one is the one that they, they will say, I'm going to follow her. I'm going to follow him. And so the charismatic leader blends authenticity of the position with their strength of character because calm courage is contagious but then so is fear so is fear and understanding that the effect that we have on others is the most valuable currency we have as a leader we are always being watched first and foremost when the shit hits the fan i always access my breath first the breath will allow us to go back into homeostasis, to help allow us to go back into neutrality. And once we have the calmness of mind, we step closer to uh, finding the solutions. And um, 
when we possess calm courage, we move in with fluidity, with ease, with grace, with flow, and then we can get into the zone and become spirited, become inspired then to find the solutions. And this is when we get to tap into unbridled energy and working towards forging, mastering in relationships, uh, mastery in skill set, mastery in human behavior. And it's these times that we can be uh, perfect examples for our team. When things aren't going so great, we know that things are going to be okay because we have the self-mastery first and what has our life already demonstrated. And how do you think a leader might deal with the self-doubt that they'll undoubtedly have in that situation? You know, it's one thing to steal your mind and, and do as best a job as you can to navigate this, but a lot of the time you'll have another little voice on your shoulder being like, this is crazy, I don't know what's going on, and I, I, don't know, I don't really know how to navigate this situation. What do you think they should do to, to still that voice uh, and still display that sort of calm leadership? Well, it's a cultivation of a practice. Because it's a cultivation of a practice, when difficult times do come, it's accessing, okay, what is my life already demonstrated? It demonstrated that two years ago, in a very similar circumstances, this is how I responded. Hey, how about we do that again? And we don't have to do it ourselves. One of the things, you know, what, what's the first, one of the first laws of the universe? You know, we all understand and we've all heard of the law of attraction. What's the first rule of the law of attraction? Become fucking attractive. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, and, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, have, have mastery over your words your thoughts, your emotions, because once we, we become attractive, then we can be, we magnetize the players. When you know where you want to go, you know who to take with you. And so the next question is, who do I need in my orbit to help me to get to where I want to go faster? And so when crisis hits, understand that you don't need to do it alone. If you have become attractive enough in your, not only your mindset, but your heart set, how much do you love? How easily do you forgive? You know, um, how, and, and your, your health set. Uh, are you looking after your personal body? Are you looking after yourself? Are you setting an example so that you can think clearly, so that you are strong and flexible and agile? When you have flexibility of the body, agility of the body, so will you have flexibility and agility and strength of the mind? And then, of course, your spirit, your soul. When all the, when these four things, all areas must be encompassed. No area can be ignored. And so when we when we have um, more mastery over those areas, we attract the, where the 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 players. We attract the big people in our orbit who get to help us, uh, especially when the times are tough. You know, understanding that the more you head into the unknown, um, the more fearless you will become. Hi everyone, I just wanted to jump in here to let you know if you're enjoying this episode, it doesn't need to stop here. We've taken this episode plus all the other episodes and also video footage from the interviews and made it available for free. There's also a bunch of fantastic guides, tools and resources you can use to grow your business. To grab those tools, just go to www.the-entourage.com forward slash podcast. Right, let's get back into the show. Uh, Pauline, this is obviously a very advanced mental model around all of this, and I'm I'm sure <laughs> you know 20 years ago when you were starting Red Lantern, you know, it was nowhere near as clear for you um, around how to how to steal your mind, how to lead others. But how how did you how did you learn this as you went along? I got some really good teachers, really good coaches, and um, when we get to the point in life where we're tired of the viewpoint that we have the point of view that we have and we're ready to develop to the next stage of our growth as human beings um, there is always a next level there is always a next level and so I, I love learning from the masters and the higher we ascend in development the more masters are waiting for us and again just as it's like talking to my daughter who is at her level of development um, we, we don't shove anything down people's throats because if they are quite happy where they are and life is so beautiful and they don't think there's anything else to learn or anywhere else to grow, then who am I to wake them from their slumber? 
<laughs> I wish them nothing but sweet dreams. <laughs> They're happy in the matrix. Leave them in the matrix. <laughs> Leave them in the matrix. So to answer your question, Tim, um, it really uh, was because from um, some amazing teachers um, telling me, you, you realize that there's more than this. You realize that there's always more and more and more. And so I spend my life up leveling <laughs> and we, we, we go, we can go very fast. Um, and, uh, it gets so much fun. Life gets so much fun. And so that, that's what I teach. Yeah. Speaking of up leveling, um, you've written two books. So there was, um, secrets of red lantern and then also the way of the spiritual entrepreneur. Um, have you always been a writer or is that something that you had to really level up? your ability, like where did the idea come from to write your first book and how did that process go? I always had a talent for writing and for speaking um, in school, uh, but because of the uh, environment at home being so violent, that shut down, it, it shut down a lot because life was all about working for my parents, going home and getting good grades. So anything, that was extracurricular, so to speak, to feed our talents. There was no time nor any tolerance for it from my parents. Um, it wasn't until I went to university, I did BA Com, that I got a hunger for it again. Um, I uh, majored in film and television and writing and journalism. So when we opened Red Lantern, someone had asked me, if they could write my story. So, well, why can't I write my own story? <laughs> why do I need someone else to write my story for? And so I thought, well, how hard could it be? How hard could it be? I had, uh, I, I wrote maybe three chapters of uh, Secrets of the Red Lantern. And I rang the publisher at the time, showed her some of my writing, and I said, and I'd also love to have um, this photographer, um, Alan Benson, look at his photography. It's honest. It's not wanky. Uh, it really shows the essence and the spirit of the food. And it's going to be a, a very dark and personal memoir disguised as a cookbook so people would buy it. <laughs> 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 and she, the, she ended the meeting by saying, um, it's going to be called Secrets of the Red Lantern. It's going to become an international bestseller. And yes, you can have Alan Benson. He is one of our resident photographers. And the rest, the rest is history. <laughs> the rest Fantastic. is history. <laughs> so, and so entrepreneurially of you as well. Let's like, <laughs> go in, I'm going to make this happen. And then it, does, it absolutely happens. Um, something else I'd actually really love to talk about is um, something I know that, that you're really passionate about at the moment is um is filthy rich and homeless this is a a, a project that you're on uh, i think i think well, it's been for a couple of years now do you, do you want to take us through um first of all you know what is the show but but more importantly why is it so important to you so last august i was invited by um, sbs to take part in a show called filthy rich and homeless five prominent australians who uh, took part in a 10-day uh, social experiment to experience how it feels and what it means to be homeless. And all our possessions were taken from us. Uh, no phone, no computer, no money. We had no food. Uh, we had to fend for ourselves. It was real. It was raw. It was very revealing. Um, Tim, my main motivation for being on the show was I wanted to experience the kindness of others. I really wanted to experience the kindness of others. Um, I had a very different experience to the other participants. Um, I think of all of us, I, I, I'm the least, uh, I, I'm in the show the least. I was very resourceful. Um, I didn't suffer. I didn't think my behavior on the show really warranted um, or was fit for uh, television drama. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't make enough drama. That's why. I didn't make like... enough drama. <laughs> Well, actually, an interesting, uh, interesting area for me. I mean, so you obviously it would have almost been coming full circle a little bit for you. I mean, that that is your childhood, right? Like you, you went through very challenging times, and, and so you may have been the best, best prepared out of everyone. Maybe that was why you dealt with it so well. Oh, uh, look, I, um, uh, I, I know human behaviour. Um, I mean, the first night I was taken out to dinner, 
Um, and <laughs> that wasn't on the show. And there was one there was one time, Tim, I had so much food on the park bench, but no Tupperware. So <laughs> I giving giving the food away to, to the homeless, you know. Um, I provided uh, I you know asked for food and provided lots of food and you know cappuccinos for my my buddy, the the homeless person that I'm buddied with. Look, I, I ran away when I was seventeen. Um, I ran away from uh, my my violent father and the violence at home. Coming to Australia as a refugee, as a boat person. Uh, we experience the kindness of others time and time again. This is this is how we got to be here. We are here today because of the kindness of others. And so the new campaign that um, I, I haven't been able to say anything about the show for a year because I was contractually bound to confidentiality. Um, but it is really to support a charity called Dignity. As an entrepreneur, you'll like this story. When I was on the show, I said to the producers, show me something that works. Show me something that works so that afterwards I can uh, get in touch with my entrepreneurs, with my influencers, with uh, some powerful people that I know to enhance something that already works. Here's the thing. When we are approaching people to be a part of this campaign, they don't understand that the what homelessness really means. They have the perception that homelessness is the person who is sleeping on the piece of cardboard on the street, um, the rough, the rough sleeper, um, possibly with um, a mental illness uh, or addiction, they make up only six percent of the one hundred and seventeen thousand reported homeless every day in Australia. Really? They so where, only... where do the majority? Uh, where does the majority come from? Um, abused women and children, entrepreneurs who've gone bankrupt and have nothing, uh, children, youth, um, the elderly. The new face of homelessness is the 55-year-old woman with children who is sleeping hidden in the park or in their cars. And so... um, when I say it can happen to any of us, I'm sure there is a small percentage where it will never happen to. But during these times when government assistance is going to end um, very soon, COVID assistance is going to end, we're going to see tough times like never before. So this is why the urgency of um, what I want to, to do now and the campaigns um uh, Lots of fun. It's going to be lots and lots of fun and all to assist dignity with what they already do. Their philosophy is when someone comes into one of their homes, if we give someone a sense of dignity to give them warm, nutritious meal, um, a a clean room with a locked door behind them, uh, fresh clothes, give them a sense of community. And when they have that sense of dignity back, they can start to fend for themselves, get their wits about them. And what dignity do is they teach people how to fish. Um, giving them a, a hand up rather than a hand out, um, especially teaching the youths how to look for a job, look for a, um, a, an a, a accommodation. And one of the things I saw time and time again, and which resonates so much with my own experience, is that if the strength and quality of character is determined by how much adversity and hardship one person can um, experience and overcome, then to never underestimate those who walk in their shoes. And uh, and this is why we're, I'm so passionate about this project and um, we're in the reach out stage at the moment. Great. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm honoured you're able to share that with us. I mean, that's amazing that it's been under wraps for so long and, and now that you can really start talking about it and, and you're right like the timing like couldn't it couldn't be more important to, to really be uh, you know trying to I love that build up people's dignity it's a it's a perfect concept and name and and I also love that there's a very similar bit there where you talked about you know giving someone some time to pause and get their wits about them and then make the next step and, and that's very similar what we're talking about about leading through crisis pause get your breath you know get your feet under you and then and go from there so thank you for thanks for sharing that with us. I um so I've got a couple more questions now to, to sort of kind of move towards the end of a, I think what's been a fantastic conversation. So these are these are a couple of questions that I haven't seen and and you haven't seen either. So 
We try and make these happen in a minute-ish. There's not really that much pressure on these. Uh, so I've got five questions here that we can just move through in rapid fire format. Are you ready to go? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, oh, we, 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 we actually accidentally almost touched on this first one. So there's a little bit of a prep here. If you could only pass down one lesson to your two kids, what would it be? Experience more joy. Oh, that's, that's empowering and big, big smile on my face from that. So that's awesome. Number two, what's the first step someone can take to become a badass manifester like yourself? Understanding that we become our associations, our associations become us. We become our words, our words become us. We become our environment, our environment becomes us. We become our associations. We have to make these decisions wisely and start living your life by design, by absolute design rather than by default, rather than saying, this is just the way it is. No, 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 no. You can start to take sovereignty back again. Yeah. So you, you design you, basically. You design everything. Okay, definitely uh, uh, we'll take a bit of a detour here into what is your favourite dish to eat? It's, uh, okay, you might as well be asking me, what is my death row dish? <laughs> 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 uh, it's a Vietnamese dish called Bum Bo Way. It's a um, uh, hot and spicy beef noodle soup with a particular type of vermicelli that is like silken on the tongue. And um, we have put so many different textures in it, uh, bean sprouts and herb. So it's a lovely concoction of heat and texture and slipperiness and crunchiness. Um, uh, that, that is my most favorite dish. There you go. I know what I am going chasing for dinner as well. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, what was the most surprising thing you found in your experience on uh, the Filthy Rich and Homeless show? <laughs> that I was terrible at television drama. No, that wasn't, that, that wasn't the most surprising <laughs> thing. That was not the most surprising thing. The most surprising thing for me and so beautiful was the youth who I spoke with and how many times they just yearned for a mother figure or a father figure. Okay, last question. Uh, if someone wants to become fearless, stress-free and unshakable in business and life, uh, what's the one thing they need to do to make that happen? Buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> <It's all. laughs> the Way of a Spiritual Entrepreneur. Um, the, first, the first chapter is uh, redefining happiness. Understanding, I, I think the happiness industry has a lot to answer for. Understanding that we are here to experience the full gamut of emotions, the full gamut of emotions. The book is, just as my first book was um, a dark and personal memoir disguised as a cookbook, this is a book about alleviating suffering and magnetizing as well as magnifying human potential disguised as a book about a spiritual entrepreneur, right? But we're meant to experience a full gamut of emotions. And so... Happiness alone ain't going to solve our business problems. <laughs> um, and fearlessness, knowing the tools to become stressless, stress-free, and knowing yourself so deeply that we remain unshakable in the face of adversity, these are much, much more powerful orientations to strive for, much more powerful orientations. And so we understand that it is not about the pursuit of happiness, but finding happiness in the pursuit. So whatever emotion you have that is not a um, powerful emotion, if it's a powerless emotion, stay there long enough to learn the lesson and do what needs to be done. Learn the lesson and do what needs to be done, but then we cultivate the practice to how we get out of that emotion into a more powerful emotion. And that's where the mastery comes in. Brilliant. That is, um, I think that is just such an amazing way to, to wrap up what I think has been an incredible conversation. It's been very, very powerful. I've, I've enjoyed, um, you know, I think we've actually only just touched on business as we've gone through. We've, <laughs> we've gotten to a much more interesting, powerful, empowering level. So um, I've thoroughly enjoyed having you on the show, Pauline. It's been a, been a really great conversation. Um, I've loved hearing your, your journey, but more importantly, um, I'm just very impressed and inspired by your mindset 
and um, and the positivity and the optimism that's come out of you know a pretty challenging journey. So thank you very much for being here and, and sharing your wisdom with with us and all the listeners. Tim, thank you so much for having me. It was my joy. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Make It Happen Show. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And it doesn't need to end there. We've actually gone and grabbed a whole bunch of extra resources for you. Behind the scenes footage, videos from this and all the other episodes, as well as show notes that you can grab for free. Just head along to www.the-entourage.com slash podcast and you can grab all those extra resources. Thanks for tuning in and I cannot wait to introduce you to our next guest on the next episode.